Okay. Hey everybody, my name is Jim Farmer. I am an arts reporter for Georgia Voice. I also coordinate Out on Film at London's LGBTQ Film Festival. Um, for those of you out there, we started our Zoom conversations last year. So please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And also please remember to like and share your favorite videos. I am so happy that we have some special guests today. Um, earlier, I found out that Strand Releasing, who is always at the forefront of LGBTQ title, LGBTQ titles, has restored four of their classic LGBT titles and making them available for streaming on June 1st. Those films are Dare, The Incredibly True Adventures of Two Girls in Love, Girls Will Be Girls, and Straight Jacket. We have the director of both of those two films, Richard Day, and one of the stars, Jack Plotnick. Welcome, guys. Thank you both for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. I have to take this. No, let me um, get rid of one. There we are. I've heard it off. I have to take this. There we are. I'm good. <laughs> Thank you for having us. It's great to sure be thing. here. Love so your principal. So Richard directed both um, Straight Jacket and Girls Will Be Girls, and Jack was in both films as well. I'm so happy to talk to you guys. Well, thanks for having us. Yes, sure thing. Well, first of all, let me ask you, what's the what's the last year been like for you two? Just just working and surviving and just getting through the craziness. I have been working on, on the sequel to Girls with the Girls. You know, it was starting to like a, a, a time that I could really devote pretty much, well, not all, but most of my uh, working attention to it. Um, but Jack has been, I'm surprised he's still alive. He was working so much. <laughs> I did, I, I, yeah, I, I did work quite a bit. I got, I, I was surprised um, that, that the business continued and it was very strange to be on sets during COVID. Uh, they, they really had a whole system down with zones and uh, you were highly masked and, and wiped down with alcohol swabs. And, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so I, I've, been, I've been surviving, thank you. What was it like the first time on one of those sets? Scary, but everyone gets tested and, and, and it, it, but it's very strange. I think, I think the whole thing was a, a traumatic for, everyone uh but but um anyway richard and i had weekly dinners uh social distance i was on on his porch and we'd create what i call the wall of air <laughs> oh yeah and then we made some evie harris shorts until we both got bored with it um but th those were a lot of fun yeah it was so great to bring evie harris back and and richard very kindly wrote some incredibly funny uh videos that i did and evie in quarantine and um anyway so those are on my youtube channel if you're curious I so guys, how did Girls or Big Girls come up for you? Um, well, it, it started with me and it started as a TV pitch because I was working um, in development in TV at the time when I had to deal with the studio. So at the same time as that's going on, my social life is to hang out with Jack and a, a group of people. And we would go to see Coco's show at the Renberg and Barla's show at the Renberg. And then Jack would perform Evie at parties and things, just you know, as favors to friends. Um, and watching all of that, and at the same time, the other part of my brain thinking like, what can I pitch to this TV studio? I just came up with the Golden Girls, but with this, these three drag queens. I've, I've never seen anything like it on TV. And I thought I was onto something. I thought I was onto a, a $100 million idea. And I took it to the studio. And they, my, they had two quotes. Um, Why not just do a show about child molestation? And the other one was, if we go out with that pitch, we'll lose all credibility as suppliers. Oh, geez. <laughs> Which was like, I guess, uh, the gay sensibility is different. I don't know. I mean, it was it was it was it was a strangely um, emphatic no. Like like <laughs> like not just no, but we're not sure that we made the right decision being in business with you. If that's what you're going to bring us. Oh wow, <laughs> that's crazy. Um, Jack, how did you how did you find Evie? I mean, how did Evie? How did you locate Evie? Well, I was doing sketch comedy with my comedy partner, Seth Rudetsky in New York. And uh, it was a character that uh, was originally inspired by uh, this, this um, infomercial lady from the eighties uh, that really tickled us. And then we started writing sketches with her among a lot of different characters I was doing at the time. But Evie was something that, that just really kept returning. Cause I just, I'm, I'm obsessed with those women, the Judy, Gar Judy, Liza, Barbara, that, that whole, period and so she kept coming up as Richard said in at parties and uh, comedy nights I would I would do it and and Richard's brilliance was to see these three characters because we were completely obsessed with Coco and Varla and what they were doing and 
him putting all three together was just such a stroke of brilliance because they, they their characters bounce off each other so well. I, I was gonna say, I mean, individually, all of these, I mean, your Evie, uh, Clinton's Coco, Jeffrey's uh, Barla Jean, you know, individually, they're all great, but put them together and there's just so much energy. And, and you're right, they just, it's just a wonderful comic meshing. I mean, Richard, can you talk about bringing them together? I mean, how, how did you, did you ever think they would work together this much in sync? Well, yes. I mean, I had a, I had a bit of a head start because Jack was doing um, one or two benefits with Coco. So I'd seen, okay. and I've been to those. So I'd seen them banter. And that was a really good, like, Laurel and Hardy kind of, um, you know, they're perfectly meshed and one's outgoing, yeah. one's, you know, more more grounded and a hundred other ways. Um, and then because I, I'd written a bunch of TV, I understood, like, that what you look for in a cast for a comedy is everybody has very different personalities that can interact. And, and so it was really easy for me to imagine, okay, now you bring into this bitter old, um, you know, not exactly mean-spirited, but certainly self-obsessed actress and this kind of um, put upon, never quite successful, low self-esteem character. A, the, a third thing that goes great with that is a kind of, you know, in her own world, ditzy uh, young character. I mean, that's what you would, that's what, how you would write it in a, in a TV show, but I didn't have to because it was just a matter of going, oh, there's one, you know, already fully formed in the, in the person of, um, you know, Barla Jean Merman. That was, and, and there weren't really like, like if I had to do a fourth one, I don't think back then there was like a fourth drag performer on that level, at least that I was aware of. And it was kind of plugged in. I mean, a lot have come since obviously, but those were the, 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 the two big ones doing it professionally and Jack, you know, a very successful actor doing this character for fun. If I remember correctly, Richard, didn't you film this at your house? I did, yeah. Okay. That was, that was the only way, I mean, I was a little bit wrong. I've always been a little bit wrong about how much things will cost sort of to yeah. my, my, my personal disasters. But um, uh, it was like, I thought, the, I, I was a TV writer and I was living in this alone in this kind of sizable house at the time. And I was aware that when you're filming things, the really expensive thing, if you, you know, is to get a soundstage, but, but, you know, once you have one, that's always free to shoot at, and it's always expensive on a show if you want to leave the soundstage. Similarly, locations are really expensive, especially because, you know, it's not your place, and you have to then bring in all these, cra it's, it's so expensive to shoot either at a stage or a location that you get, but if you have a house, and it's big enough to, sh to house a shoot, it just seemed like a, an amazing resource because you know cameras had gotten so inexpensive and video high def video had made had made that kind of a trivial expense and I was under the impression incorrectly that therefore I could make a movie for practically nothing. Um, it, it turned out there's a lot of other expenses, but yes. that's how it happened. And it was I gotta say a huge benefit to just have that home base, just to know that's where the production lives. No one can kick us out. No one will see us, and it's got you know enough different spaces in it that it won't seem completely staged now. Sure. The film came out to a critical success, commercial success. Um, you three won Best Actress at Outfest, if I remember. Con belated congratulations. Thank you. Can, can both of you talk to, talk about how that film changed your, your per personal and professional lives, your careers? Well, I was completely inspired by Richard's um, artistic, um, passion to get his voice out on film and not wait for someone to invite him to do that, but do it himself. I, I, I mean, it was the first time I, that I'd ever done something that was totally the kind of humor I liked, because that's not going to get made uh, for network television. And, um, and so Richard's can do kind of approach and just say, if you want to make it, make it really, really changed my life because it inspired me to, to do the same. And um, yeah, so I guess that I, I'm just very inspired by, by Richard and how, how he just makes things happen. Because I mean, yeah, he just, it was so homemade and we just did it. It was, and um, I mean, I have to really cop to this incredible amount of privilege that, that kind of was the engine behind the whole thing. Because I was working as a TV writer, you know, around, we're talking around, you know, 2000-ish, and they paid you pretty well. And I'm, I'm gay, so I didn't have any, you know, dependents or anything. Yeah. Um, but that, that's a really fortunate position to be in, to have enough money that you could do. For instance, I did an off Broadway play in this film, and the next film. Um, so it's not like uh, I had a big head start that I had nothing to do with, you know. 
um, in, in that regard. But in terms of the, um, and why I did it, it was because working in TV at the time, you really, it, now there's Netflix and there's, you know, there was HBO, but now there's a hundred HBOs. And there's this sense that if you have a really interesting vision, you might be able to get it on the air. It's more of a lottery, but back then there wasn't even that. You had to do network television in all of its, you know, just very straightforward, not particularly challenging and very straight. Yeah. Uh, straight right. <laughs> so I couldn't, you know, I mean, I, I, I really felt like I'm going to go my whole life and I'll have you know, had a successful career and I could tell people I have, my name is on that TV show I don't like and that other one I don't like, but no one was going to make my show. Like when I would pitch them, like I said, they just, they couldn't believe somebody would be that out of touch to want to pitch a drive show. I realized I'm going to have to make this stuff myself and why not? You know, if I'm going to get my vision out there, it's just not going to happen any other way. By the way, that's how all films in the gay world pretty much get made. There's no, there's no studio making them. There's no market for it. It's just people that you could, you know, finally uh, decided they were going to do it themselves. Um, and no one has a more wicked sense of humor than Richard. And I'm just so grateful that that the world discovered it. Well, you, I, I, I became as obsessed as I was with the things that came out of his mouth, which I, I was always in complete shock. Well, you want to know what a, a big uh, miscalculation I made as well. So the whole the whole existence of these films is based on you know me not being very savvy about the marketplace. Um, I thought, you know, there was this model at the time, especially, you, you know, you make your independent movie and if it's good and if it goes to Sundance, then you can do studio films. And then who knows, you're off to the races. You know, we've seen that happen a lot of times. And so that's what I did. And I made the films that interested me and those were gay films, but they did get the reaction you're talking about. Like, except with an asterisk, they did get that reaction among gay people. Um, it didn't occur to me that these films were entirely invisible to 90% of Hollywood and, and the world at large, that, that straight people and straight executives do not go to or know about gay movies at all. So, you know, it got to a point where you could say girls would be girls to any gay person and they probably know what you're talking about. They might not have seen it or liked it, but they would be aware of it. With straight people, I'm sure it's true to this day, but it, it, it really killed me at meetings and kept anything from really happening from these movies. You'd have to explain, Girls with the Girls, yes, it's a movie, it's a feature, it stars drag queens. Why drag queen? Okay, never mind. You know, just, it, it did nothing for my career, I, or, you know, except give me confidence. I know that you, you've done um, a spinoff web series, but I know that for the longest time there was talk of a sequel, and, and if I just heard you correctly, it sounds like that is still very much a possibility. Can you tell us more? Um, well, we filmed it a rather a long time ago, actually, and um, it was filmed in a particular way with green screen because uh, we had much, much less money. Mm -hmm. And I'm not working so much in TV anymore. So I don't have like, you know, my own reserve money to draw up on. And uh, Jack had a friend, William Butler, was very kind enough to lend us this whole green screen studio for free, a huge resource, just like the house was. Um, and we shot a lot of the movie there. And it's, you know, there's a courtroom, there's a, uh, what do we got in there? Uh, a science fiction kind of space center. We've got a hospital, we've got, uh, 10 different things, a whole uh, ethereal heaven set, but you have to build it and add it in later. And I thought that would be a lot easier than it was. And that's been the big roadblock to that thing coming out is learning how to make CG and how to comp actors from green screen and not particularly well shot green screen with, you know, cameras that weren't really designed to, to be that accurate. Um, that's been the hold of it, getting it to look good enough that I won't be embarrassed by it. Um, yeah. I think we're on our but, way though. We've, 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 yeah, when would you guess it'll be done, Richard? Fall. <laughs> this year. It might, be, it might be fall. I mean, it's, it, it depends on how, it, everything goes slower than I think. Sure. But, you know, I was working on it yesterday. I'll work on it today. It'll be really nice. Good. Nice. So, Girls Will Be Girls was 2003. In 2006 was Straight Jacket, which was based on, if I remember correctly, a play of yours, Richard? Uh, yes, it was, and similar story. I, I'd written that actually as a screenplay much earlier than that, like in the 90s, because I was obsessed with um, Doris Day rock cuts and comedies and that whole, you know, 50s, because it was camp. It was the closest thing you can get to camp in Hollywood is things they don't know are camp. And, uh, and I, just, I just was tickled by those movies and all of their artifice, but all of the precision of their writing. And I wanted to, and they all had rock Hudson in it. And I was really aware, you know, the movies are always rock Hudson pretends to be something for some reason. And, then he falls in love with, uh, you know, a, a woman of substance and has to undo the 
illusion or whatever the uh, the lie that he is, you know, told at the beginning of the movie before she finds out about it. It's always very complicated. And I thought Rock Hudson was living that very story as he was making those movies. I mean, he was married to a woman who I think was in on it, but she's but the but the the, the way I got the idea for that movie is I think her name was Phyllis Skates. I'm not positive. Um, she wrote a book, and even though she was the assistant of this manager that only dealt with handsome gay stars. So, I mean, she saw what went on in that office and she knew who Rock was. And she's the one that married him because he needed a cover story. But in the book, she didn't have any idea. She fell in love with Rock and Rock, it was deceptive. And, and the only reason she took him to the cleaners and the divorce was she felt so betrayed at the end of the two years that was specified in her contract. Um, so <laughs> just like, I thought, well, what if that's true? If that's true, th then, that puts Rock Hudson in a Rock Hudson movie. And then I tried to make it like a Rock Hudson movie but in a very artificial way. I couldn't get, back then, no actor would play gay. I mean, or they play gay once. That's what we got a lot that I found so infuriating. Well, he's already played gay. Like it's a, like it's a, a teenage vampire kind of, or, or whatever, or a role you have to do for credibility, but then you wash your hands up. Um, couldn't get it financed. And then was in New York doing Spin City. And you know, when you're in an environment, you're aware of the art going on around you. And, Theater was the thing that was going on there, not so much, um, you know, filmmaking. And I just thought I could turn that into a play. It was written to be stage bound, like those films always were. And I did, and um, it didn't exactly set the world on fire, but I liked it. So I made it as a movie later. Nice. Straight it was groundbreaking. I mean, it dealt with the concept of gay marriage long before that was on everybody's radar. And it, it, it's, it's just a beautiful, marvelous, funny movie. Yeah. You know what the problem with the, perception of the play and to a degree the perception of the movie too was the idea was always to emulate the corniness and the artifice of those Rock Hudson movies but the problem is if if you don't exactly thread that needle it just looks like you're doing sitcom which was my background um, and then people just think oh you just made a sitcom like they don't give you credit for or they're not in on the conceit of the whole piece, which is ultimately my fault, but I felt that there were reviewers that just didn't understand this wasn't trying to be, you know, kitchen sink theater. The, the whole, the idea that everyone's talking in jokes and it's very arch was intentional and not, you know, because I didn't understand the form. Mm -hmm. And in the movie, the same thing happened a little bit because unfortunately you're trying to recreate a very high budget look in its way without any money and that's hard to do. Yeah. So Jack, how did you come aboard on Straight Jacket? Oh, well, I just, I love Richard and I would do anything he asked me for. And there was a little part and I was happy to do it. Nice. I probably begged. <laughs> no, I wanted, that's, that's the straight world as well. You know, Rock is, is gay and I wanted, and he has a straight counterpart, sort of a Tony Curtis type mm -hmm. that uh, always wants Rock Hudson's roles. And I thought I should put a gay actor in there. Like, I mean, it just, it just, it just made sense in, in a backwards way. Yeah. So he's doing like, kind of like sort of a camp interpretation of straight men, I think, more than just embodying a straight man, which I think is a really a smart choice. Yeah, I, I, I've always been impressed by Straight Jacket's really strong ensemble cast, but I have to ask you about two actresses in particular, Carrie Preston and Veronica Cartwright. Can you talk about Carrie and then Veronica? Um, the cast, incredible. Yeah, well, Carrie was, I mean, a lot of the cast was carryovers from the play. I just cast Carrie mm -hmm. um, in the play and she was really good and then immediately kind of took off after that. I mean, she was already very successful in the, on the stage at the time that she did the, the role, but um, then she began to be a real big presence in TV and, and um, made a couple of movies herself actually. So that was a no brainer to see if she would do it. And when she did, I think, you know, it's, it, it's one of the performances that, that makes the whole movie work to the you know, extent it does. Um, that, you know, and then I also wanted Jackie Hoffman, who was also in the play and has done yeah. a, a number of things since, but she was in Hairspray at the time. And we were filming at this very crucial time. Ordinarily, they might've let her out, but it was Tony voting season. So she had to be on stage every night with Tony voters game. She couldn't do it. So then that just became, well, we're gonna cast this role. And uh, Kami Patton and Irene Kagan, who were these casting directors I'd worked with um, on pilots, it just, they just have this weird, like I've, I've done two things with them that have done, you know, been produced and in both cases, you look at the cast now and it's full of big stars <coughs> that weren't stars at the time. It's just she had that good of an eye. Um, and uh, Veronica was already a star, but she just came up with that. And what I'm saying is she has an ability to look at the role and know who's going to prosper in it 
And she came in with um, the idea of Veronica Cartwright, who was nice enough to do it. You know, she didn't need to. And I think she's really good in the role, too. Okay. I, I was working at the Midtown Art Cinema in Atlanta. I was their marketing manager. And so I was handling, promoting all the all the films that are there. Um, and so we showed Straight Jacket. And Carrie actually, who lives in Macon outside of Atlanta, was down for the screening. We had a great screening that night, a really great cue. Oh, it was yeah. really, really good. It's um, an audience pleaser. Yeah. So Straight Jacket is about a movie star who marries a secretary to hide the fact that he's gay. I'm wondering how much of that, obviously you referenced Rod Cousin, how much of that still goes on today? Um, I think it's probably worse today and yeah. it's going to get worse still before it gets better if it does. Yeah. Because Hollywood is becoming global. I mean, there was this brief window when gay material was okay. And that was when DVDs were big, like around 2000 to 2006. And you see a lot of the, the things we now think of as gay classics, like Gods and Monsters and Trick and All the Rest happening then. Mm -hmm. um, then DVD went away and Hollywood made up for that by going into the foreign market. The reason that's important is that Hollywood had just kind of come to the idea that there's a gay market and it's like the black market. It's not necessarily going to be, you know, giant money, but it's consistent money. Um, mm -hmm. And then suddenly they're making things for the global market. And the whole morality of Hollywood movies goes back to whatever is acceptable in India or Russia, where it's illegal to show gay movies, you know, in some of these places. So gay characters just were wiped off the movie screen. Um, and I think that's going to start to happen in TV now that these streaming services are going global too, because that hasn't changed. And Hollywood, you know, true to form, did not stand up for anything. It just said, okay, no more gay people. Gotcha. Uh, check. We'll do that. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and so since, you know, you're going to have to be movie stars to be in these things, I don't know what goes on in, in young actors' heads, but I would imagine some of them are looking at the landscape and going, I'm not going to come out. Yeah. I, I think that's a mistake, not because they could necessarily succeed and be out, but because it's not worth it to bend your whole life into a pretzel for yeah. a film career. They shouldn't have to, like you're granted that. Yeah. Jack, have you ever encountered any, any, I mean, as an out actor, have you ever faced any kind of discrimination or homophobia or, or something? Okay. I can't believe that the jobs I've booked with Evie on in on YouTube saying the, the stuff that comes out of her mouth. Like, I, I don't know if it's just not on their radar, but I've been a spokesman for a lot of different corporate products. Yeah. And I'm like, I guess they didn't watch Girls Will Be Girls because if they <laughs> had, I never would have gotten it. But, um, you know, I can't know what opportunities I missed, but I love my career and I'm glad I always was out because I agree with Richard. You got to live your life in truth. Sure. This is a question for both of you. Um, representation is always something that, that we talk about in, in the LGBT community. How important is it these days, not only to have LGBTQ actors playing LGBTQ roles, but also people behind the camera, the directors and people really making these, these project authentic? I think that's important. And I, I mean, especially because of what I just talked about, how there's not a lot of gay material that they allow to be produced. So yeah. the few things that, I mean, just on a, almost starting with just, just decency, like, you know, straight people get 99% of everything already. And there's this 1% of gay things that sometimes happen and they're going to take those two. I mean, there's, there's, there's just that. And there's also the sense that, you know, movies that would have been good, like the Liberace movie and like Brokeback Mountain, and I know those have their fans, but I look at them as just straight people cluelessly guessing what gay things are. Mm. And it seems like it's pretty dark to them. It's pretty sad, you know, broke, and people are always dying in these movies and their tragedies. And it's like, and, you know, Brokeback Mountain, it's just like Jake Gyllenhaal practically rapes Heath Ledger. And then you get 10 minutes of just sunsets and wildflowers but you get the taste out of your mouth you know it's just not nothing is presented as light and fun and just part of life when straight people get their hands on it because it's not how they see it generally <laughs> speaking of course um in terms of like should i mean i'll tell you that when we made these movies like straight jacket you there, there were no gay stars for uh, many reasons but when you say gay people if you want somebody with a name who wants to play a gay role back then they didn't exist and the up and coming gay actors wouldn't take gay roles because they didn't want to have be you know typecast by something they're trying to avoid in their in their real lives. That's why we ended up casting straight actors actually back then. It's a different time. Now I think you could you could do it. Um, and I I don't have a strong opinion about whether it's morally right or wrong to cast a straight actor in a, in a gay role. I mean 
Jack, what are your thoughts on representation and where we are right now? Is that a different question or the yeah, same one? The same question, yeah. Oh, well, I, th I love this new thing where people are going, you know what, if it's a gay role, it should be played by a gay person. Like, I like that, but I, 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 I don't know about morally or whatever, but I, I you know, I, I wish that, 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 you know, I'm in the prom that, that it was given to the, the gay actor who starred on Broadway and not to James, uh, because, and that's just a fear of like, will we get enough eyes on this? And I just think that's a shame, but I do, I've been in Hollywood long enough to understand that they need an audience and that's one way to do it. But anyway, I, I hope we continue going in this direction. If you're playing, if, if it's a trans character, I would love it to be a trans actor and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I, it, I'm sorry, maybe it is a self-fulfilling or a self-propagating problem because since they don't do gay material and don't seem welcoming of gay people, you don't have a lot of out gay actors. And the ones that there are don't get a lot of opportunities to become stars. And so suddenly you have a gay starring role and the system has, made sure in various ways there aren't gay actors with big enough names to, to play those roles. Guys, how did you um, how did you react when you found out that Strand was restoring and, and putting all these films online for potentially a new generation of audiences? <laughs> Jack, well, it didn't just happen. I have to say Michael Warwick, the producer of the film, was just tireless in, in getting these movies out there again. Okay. And Strand, Strand ended up being an excellent partner for it. And we've just been thrilled with the amount of, you know, just their heft they've put behind it and, and you know, elbow grease and making sure these are known. You know, these releases don't just happen, but are gotcha. but are trumpeted. And, and, and I think it'll be a real chance for them to be seen again. But it wasn't, you know, inevitable. Like Michael was the one that was really just knocking on doors and, and not giving up and making sure they got out there again. Okay. So I, I, was, I, I was talking to, to Jack earlier, um, I was looking on IMDb, and it feels like Jack has like seventy-four projects that are coming up. What are what are some of the projects you're working on, Jack? Uh, sorry, because I don't feel like I have that much going on. I mean, I'm I got it real into creating my these after I I directed a film and then I directed a Broadway show I, that both I co-wrote, and then I was like, am I an actor? Because I really forgot, like I I really got out of touch with my acting, and so um I started making comedy videos. I have a YouTube channel, and I got real into it, and um I I've been currently doing this series of of Disney uh, inspired videos that I'm really excited. At, at the attention and surprise the attention they're getting. So I'm currently working on my sort of biggest one yet. Okay. But, uh, and I've got some projects that I'm hoping will happen, but they're all, it's all too soon to say, but I'm, I'm cooking, I'm cooking. Oh, great. Thank you. Yes, I'm getting this. There we go. Hi. <laughs> what are you working on? Me? Nothing. I'm I'm not, I'm I'm working on I'm working on um, a book and I'm also working on the uh, you know my own stuff basically but one of those being the sequel to Girls Will Be Girls TV is it's I, it, speaking of uh, representation and access it's it's really hard to keep a career going when you're gay in Hollywood because all of the material is straight but also all of the people are straight and they just form these friendships that you're not allowed in. And you know, and so that's fine when you're in your like prime earning years. But as you get a little older, you start to notice all the women are feeling away, all the gay people are feeling away, all the minorities, all this left are this you know smaller and smaller group of older and older straight white men, you know, um, because that's this social structure that you have to be a part of to keep the career going in the long term that many are excluded from. I, I think I'm going to start a rumor that Girls Will Be Girls 2012 is going to be available for fall festivals and see, <laughs> and, and cross my fingers that it will be, you know, guys, um, uh, yeah, that would be so kind of I amazing. Know. Yeah. Um, so both Straight Jacket and Girls Will Be Girls have been restored and now will be available on streaming as of June 1st. So if you have not seen those films, please watch those. And if you have seen them, watch them watch them again. I uh, appreciate their genius. Guys, thank you much for joining us, Jack, Richard. This has been great catching up. Oh, I loved it. Thank you for having us. Congratulations on the films. Thanks so much. Thank you. Y'all have a great day. You too. Thanks so much.